So in this fourth part, I will uh, continue to illustrate the cellular basis, uh, synaptic basis of learning and memory uh, by talking about how a uh, neural circuit might remember or learn the time interval of uh, events by using a spike time independent plasticity. Now, this study uh, I want to illustrate is, was done in a, a cell culture system. A culture consists of randomly connected uh, hippocampal neurons. And we're going to stimulate this random network and to see uh, with a pattern of stimulation and to see how that pattern can be stored into the synaptic modification within the network. Now, the, the simplest uh, stimulus that have a time interval uh, information in it would be a, a trend of a pair of pulses with, a, with the same time interval. For example, we have a trend of, of two pulses, uh, uh, a pair pulse. The pair pulse has a specific interpulse uh, uh, interval that can be set. Now, between this pair pulse, we have a waiting time. And this would be uh, um, the information that the circuit needs to remember is simple. It will remember the pair pulse, the interval of the pair pulse. Now, uh, how would the uh, circuit remember this? Let's again begin with a, with a uh, uh, Gedanken experiment. Let's say we have a group of cells uh, interconnected at random in, in, in cell culture. We can monitor their synaptic connectivity uh, synaptic strength be between uh, the connections between cells. By stimulating one cell, uh, uh, measuring the response in another to measure their synaptic connections. Now, the Gedanken experiment begins with this. Uh, can we monitor the, the synaptic efficacy within a polyneuronal pathway within the network. Experimentally, uh, we know that if we stimulate one cell and record it from another cell within the group of cells connected uh, uh, in the culture, what we can detect is the following. The, the, if you stimulate one cell, you record from the other cell, the other cell will show up with the synaptic currents. Now, this is the, the actually the inward current, excited inward current into the, uh, the cell I recorded. Stimulating one cell, you record it from another cell. This is a recorded response. Recorded response with time the, on, along this axis. You see that recorded response always has three peaks, and they repeat each other quite reproducibly with time. Um, sometimes there's failures, but most time you get the, all three response. What would this three response represent? And in this case, one can imagine that um, this, this, when a cell was stimulated, one cell was stimulated, it, uh, it transmits signals to the recorded cells with, within three different times. The arrival of the response at three, one, two, three, three different times, at different time of arrival. The arrival time can differ by tens of milliseconds. That suggests that the cell is actually exciting other cells in the pathway, different amount of, different number of cells in the pathway. Eventually, they all feed into the cell that we're recording. So by monitoring the, uh, the polysynaptic response, the peak, one, two, three, different peaks, we are actually monitoring the efficiency of transmission of signals through different pathways within the culture network. And these pathways normally are stable. In order for the experiments uh, to, to work, we need stable recording, a stable uh, network. We can see the, the stability here. Within one hour time, if we, if we uh, represent the synaptic current by color, the, this color gram, the, the red color means the highest uh, amplitude of synaptic current. You see that uh, 
that each, each synaptic current is now represented in one line here. And with time, you can see that the synaptic current does not change. The peak, uh, white here is the, the highest peak. The peak one uh, and two and peak three, all three peaks remain relatively stable with time for 60 minutes. So it's a stable circuit. So the Gedanken experiment, the thought experiment is the follows. So now if we give a, a two pulse to this circuit in a stimulation, if we stimulate the cell with two pulse, a pair pulse, one, two, this is a, with an inter-pulse interval of a fixed interval that we decide, that's the information we want to give, in, to, give to, the, uh, to the circuit. So the first pulse, the red arrow here, the first pulse would, would be a, a stimulus to cell one, and what one can record, after the time delay in a distant cell, one can detect two events, let's say. One event is a subthreshold synaptic, synaptic uh, potential. And, and the second event is through a different pathway with a delay that gives the excitation of uh, action potential, a, 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 a supra-threshold excitation. To, so a, a single pulse in cell one produces two signals at a recorded cell, a depolarization and a spike. So now if you do the second pulse that comes in the blue arrow with an with a, uh, inter-spike interval as shown here, the blue arrows now produce again a subthreshold depolarization, blue depolarization, blue action potential here. So now you see if the interspike interval is happened to be a right uh, interval, the blue depolarization, EPSP produced by the second pulse, may fail before the action potential created by the first pulse. So you have a situation of pre-synaptic input be occurring within a time window of 40 milliseconds before the spiking of the postsynaptic cell. So pre before post, this synapse will be potentiated. You get an LTP. Now imagine, now if we extended this interpulse interval to a different length, then you might have a different overlap of the first events. Uh, for example, the, the uh, blue pulse uh, induced EPSP may fall behind the action potential created by the first pulse, the red pulse. Now you have a postsynaptic spike in before presynaptic spike uh, input, post before pre, this blue EPSP will be depressed. This is a spike time independent plasticity. So different interpost interval will create at the same synapse a depression rather than potentiation as in this case. So now this is only thought experiment that, that could happen. If the spike time dependent process is, is, is happening, which we show in this culture system, they do. They, 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 uh, they, uh, they do happen in this culture system. So we would predict by these uh, timing differences, a pale pulse, depending on the interval of this pale pulse, you can create either LTP or LTD of the synapse on a distant target cell within the circuit. Right? So this is the basic idea. Let's see if we can show this, uh, that the circuit can actually remember this. So we call this a pathway remodeling induced by pale pulse stimulation. So uh, here's a simple experiment. So you stimulate a presynaptic cell, and then you record the, the, uh, the the response in a postsynaptic cell. Now, we in, in this experiment, we are we are drawing a presynaptic cell stimulation and recording from postsynaptic cell. In fact, you can have polysynaptic pathway that that eventually come back to the same cell that you are stimulating. So, in fact, to save the trouble, in fact, one recording electrode is enough. You can use this uh, one cell to in stimulate this cell and record from that same cell. And that's an even simpler experiment. This is what happened here. In this experiment, we, we are actually stimulating 
one cell and recording from itself. And we found that uh, before the uh, all the uh, conditioning, a test stimulus, uh, a stimulation of, of the cell, which is the huge artifact of stimulus. But the response is showing up here as a synaptic current, which is a very consistent synaptic current, a feedback synaptic current onto itself. Right? So there's a, uh, a, 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 a loop that's being monitored here. So now we apply a condition stimulus of pale pulse stimulation, bop, 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 this pale stimulation with 50 milliseconds interval. Now this pale stimulation was applied for 40 times, 40, 50 times. Uh, um, after that, we now test again, stimulate one uh, cell, uh, the same cell, and look at the, this pathway that we found here to be stable for a long time. You see, after a brief period of stimulation of pale pulse, suddenly the same stimulation create not only the original response, there's a two different response appearing. As, uh, two peaks show up in, this, in, this, uh, res uh, in the response. The two peaks represent what? Well, this is a delay of uh, tens of milliseconds. That means these two paths, this represent two different pathways that are activated after pale pulse stimulation that activated uh, and feedback to the same cell you're recording. So now you have pathway, new pathway are open through this, uh, through this uh, pale pulse stimulation. Now, another example. Now in this example, we're actually using two cells. You're stimulating one cell and recording from another. The other cell, uh, you're recording, when stimulating one cell, you, you find the response in the, in the second cells have three peaks, three synaptic current, distinct synaptic current, representing three pathways, polysynaptic pathway, that reach in the recorded cell that are stable with time. So now, pale pulse conditioning with 30 milliseconds create a change, a modification. The third peak, the third, uh, the, this pathway is totally eliminated. Old pathway is eliminated, closed. While the, 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 the two pathways here are still remaining, remaining after pale pulse, although the second pathway seems to be reduced in its uh, efficacy. There's a more failure here. Now again, the third example, the, the old pathway is actually uh, facilitated. They are more reliable after 50 millisecond pale pulse. The fourth example, 100 millisecond pale pulse stimulation 50 times produce a uh, old pathway that are reducing in its efficacy and new pathway are open. This, this is a new pathway three. So we represent all these type of experiment. It's easier to use in this color gram. This color gram is, is a simple representation of this, this complicated synaptic current. The color represents amplitude of the current. So a new color appearing here, showing that means a new, new polysynaptic pathway are open. So you have uh, stimulation, you can record from a different cell, or you can record from itself. Right? So this is a stimulation recording from the same cell. They are p starting with a pathway. For example, here you have two pathways to begin with, two peaks. And then with a certain stimulation, with a 40 millisecond stimulation, new pathway, three and four are open. And that pathway open gives you these new peaks that are appearing here, three and four. Right? So, uh, so uh, but if you do a different uh, 60 millisecond pair pulse, even the same 50 pairs, you produce no change, no persistent change, a transient change of a transient opening of some pathway, but then disappear, you still return to original state. So a switch in the state of a new pathway that's a, that are persistently open uh, by, specifically by this 40 millisecond pair pulse. So that indicate that the interval, this, the circuit is now memorizing 40 milliseconds by changing its synaptic strength in these two pathways so that they can now conduct signals. Now, the same thing here, 100 milliseconds doesn't work, 50 milliseconds worked, and 20 milliseconds, no change. 
So all these experiments eventually, one can test how many new pathways can you open? What is the probability of changing, changing pathways? The probability of changing pathways shown here in this graph is pretty high on, uh, for interpulse intervals spreading from uh, tens of milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. You can still see pathways, uh, uh, can modify the pathway with uh, interval timing of 200 milliseconds. In other words, if you have repetitive intervals of 200 milliseconds, that information can be stored in this randomly connected network, consists of about 20 hippocampal neurons. By changing the synaptic strength among this group of cells, some potentiation, some depression, store in different places, a distributed memory uh, uh, storage within the network. Now this is LTP and LTD, and uh, we, we show, in fact, recording uh, directly that there, there's changing, long-term change in plasticity, changing in the uh, synaptic strength. In fact, they're also APV dependent, AMDA receptor dependent. If you block AMDA receptor, the red dot here, the probability of changing is greatly reduced. So this is an example that the circuit can memorize information up to, to 200 milliseconds. So now, what is exactly changing in the, in the cell? It's hard to, to uh, uh, the, the culture model system is a model system. Right? What we really need to, to have is in vivo in the brain, in intact brain, can a, an ensemble, a group of cells, uh, uh, by changing their connectivity uh, to store the information uh, from the sensory experience. So now we come back to, again, to a retinal tactile system to look at a group of cells firing the retinal tactile system. Now, we used the uh, Xenopus uh, tadpole before, uh, but Xenopus tadpole are not very good for, it's good for recording uh, individual cells, but not good for looking at many cells. Uh, uh, for that, we need uh, imaging uh, that uh, a, a tissue that's more transparent, such as a zebrafish, for monitoring activities within the cell, so using optical methods. Now here is a, a group of uh, optical tactile cells, hundreds of cells, uh, labeled with calcium sensitive dye that can reflect the calcium elevation in the cell in response to spiking or uh, firing of the cells. So calcium signal is a representation directly proportional to the number of spikes fired in these cells. So by looking at the calcium signal, we can uh, monitor the activity within this ensemble of hundreds of cells. And we see what, what, whether they are, uh, our hope was to, to understand whether there are cells, the, uh, that ensemble of cells that can be activated by HAP's idea of cell assembly to by a specific uh, sensory stimulus. And that activation can persist and their connectivity can be strengthened and as a way of storing information. And among that stored information include the sequence of events and interval of events. Right? So this is the original hope, but we only uh, are making a small step toward that, toward that goal. Now, that here we have already uh, accomplished uh, some, some progress in this, along this direction. For example, we can monitor um, uh, calcium signal in response to a sweeping of a moving bar, as I showed you before. A moving bar across the retina create a calcium signal in the cells. Every time moving bar goes across, calcium goes up, reflecting the, the uh, in this particular cell, the calcium level goes up in response to the moving bar sweeping across the retina. Uh, this, this represents, in fact, a barrage of action potentials in the cell that create this calcium influx. But some cell doesn't respond. For example, this cell doesn't respond at all to the moving bar. This cell responds unreliably, occasionally, to, to some moving stimulus, suggesting that there are different activations, different retinal ganglion cells are feeding into the tactile cells. Um, uh, some are very effective uh, being activated, others are not. So in fact, we can do uh, hundreds of cells. In here showing 200 cells, 
uh, we now represent the calcium signal by the gray, gray scale. The dark means higher calcium. So each cell is one line here. In the cell, uh, there are two, 20 uh, stimulus moving bar across the retina. Every time you, uh, the moving bar goes across, you get a calcium signal. Calcium signal goes up, goes up. Uh, so 20, 20 calcium, calcium uh, signal. Now, when the moving bar now you, is moving from left to right, rightward moving bar, rather than the opposite direction, the opposite direction moving bar gives him much less activity in this particular cell. This cell shows high activity, but the activity are reduced, are smaller, much smaller for cells for the opposite moving bar. Now, in this, this bar, this for these cells, for example, are selectively response to rightward moving bar. They are not respond, uh, responding to at all to leftward moving bar. So there's specificity. And there's a reproducibility. The same cell that respond first time to, to a leftward bar, uh, respond again with leftward bar. So there's a reproducibility and there's a specificity of the response. Now, the, the, you can draw this uh, in, in, a, in a color gram here. The red cell, uh, the green cells here, are responding only to the left bar, leftward moving bar. The red are responding only to the rightward moving bar. And the yellow are those cells responding to both. Right? There's a, uh, so there's overlap of cells. There's two group of two ensemble of cells that are overlapping. That, uh, but each ensemble is specific to uh, each ensemble is specific to the moving bar to particular direction. So now, our real experiment is whether the the, uh, the this group of cells can store information in the moving bar, right? So what happened to when you condition this uh, the retina with a specific moving bar in one direction, uh, moving into uh, condition stimulus moving in particular direction for 20 times. And what happened afterwards? Anything, any activity are stored or synaptic change are happening in, the, in this group of cells. So we look for it, look for these changes. The first thing we found is this is interesting after conditioning, uh, calcium transients that occur among a group of cells uh, this is a, a recording among 200 cells. Now, so the, the, during the conditioning, every time you get very good uh, calcium signal, correlated calcium signal across this uh, group of cells. Now, um, a subset of these cells show calcium signal after the conditioning stimulus is terminated, was terminated. So after you have no longer moving bars across the retina, at an uh, interval of the same in time interval as the condition stimulus, calcium transient reappeared. There's a rhythmic calcium transient that occurring for three times among a subset of neurons that responded to the moving bar. Now that's, that's uh, uh, interesting because that's the uh, traces left over from the conditioning. That's the memory, the memory trace. Now here is showing this calcium, uh, calcium level that's measured. Now, interestingly, that this calcium transient, so-called post-conditional calcium transient, which represents spiking of neuron. Remember the calcium is caused by spiking. Now, so the, the spiking of these uh, neurons occurs at a time interval that corresponds exactly the same interval as the conditioning. So here we have a, a four second conditioning. The last four, uh, four conditioning stimulus after uh, a, a 20, uh, last four of the 20 conditioning stimulus showing up here. But after conditioning is turned turn off, you still see this re re repeated tra calcium transient at the right interval of four seconds. Now, if you condition with six seconds, the transient occur at six seconds. If you condition with 10 seconds interval, the, the post-conditioning transient occurs at 10 seconds interval. 
right? So the, the system remembers the conditional, in, conditional interval by repeating the same spiking among this group of cells, a subgroup of cells, uh, of the ensemble cells. So here's uh, the, the histogram showing the, the clearly concentrated uh, rhythmic activity that fits with the, uh, in a spontaneous activity, it doesn't show this. There's no, when, when there's no uh, conditioning, the spontaneous activity shows no rhythmic activity. But the rhythmic activity at four seconds, six seconds, and 10 seconds occurs after specific conditioning of a particular interval. Now the time duration of this, uh, this re, re, uh, reappearance of, uh, of rhythmic activity is limited. It's only 20 seconds or so. Right? So in, in this case of 10 seconds uh, conditioning, it will repeat it twice, occasionally third times, but mostly within the first 20 seconds. But you get more repetition if you have a six seconds interval. So you have more cases up to 18 seconds. You can see calcium transient. Then you, then you disappear. So it's a shorter memory. So uh, this uh, reverberative, uh, reverberatory ensemble activity uh, are in stimulus specific. So left bar, left were moving bar, creating rhythmic activity among this group of cells. But the right one moving bar uh, is creating a, a reverberating activity on a different group of cells. Not the same, not the same group, right? So this is the same set of uh, 100 cells that will monitor their rhythmic activity afterwards. So what does this mean to, uh, to the animal? What, what, what's the use for the animal to remember this uh, rhythmic activity? So we can, uh, the zebra, uh, zebrafish has this nice thing that we can do behavior. If we immobilize the zebrafish on the stage where we can monitor using agar, transparent agar, the immobilize the head, but allow the tail to, to flip around, we can monitor the activity in the brain. At the same time, we can monitor the tail flip uh, to which is uh, an indication of the, uh, the motor activity that, that uh, drive the swimming of the, of the, drive the escape behavior of the uh, zebrafish. So here we found that interestingly, you can uh, use this moving bar or flashes of, of uh, light to trigger the escape behavior of the fish. And, and this uh, is pretty reproducible. If you're conditioned in this case with, with the flashes, every time you do a flash, the tail would flip. Uh, the flip, this is a sequence of flipping of tail. And you can monitor the tail flip with this uh, uh, quantitatively, right? this, this, uh, by the curvature of the tail. So here's the curvature of the tail, that every time the, the flash is on at a, at a six second interval, you have a tail flip. You more or less reproducibly, 60% of the time you get tail flip reproducibly. So now the interesting experiment happens when you stop the tail flip, uh, stop the, uh, the uh, flashes at this time. And after the flash is terminated, this is the last flash, you find two more tail flips occurring right at the six second intervals after the, uh, the, uh, the termination of the conditioning stimulus. So fish remember to behavior you, the, this, mem uh, this memory of this interval of conditioning are reflected in, in a visual motor behavior of the zebrafish in, in their escape behavior. Now, in the absence, no, no slight stimulus, they remember this and they, they flip the tail. So I have a movie for this, which show this, this uh, uh, last four conditioning stimulus that cause tail flip. And I will use the, um, uh, a, a, a sound to represent the timing of the flash. And the, 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 the fish didn't hear the sound. This is the, when making a movie, I put a sound to indicate the, the, uh, the timing of the flash. So go ahead. 
So we'll see the last four tail flip created by this, by the, that's the sound, that's the flash. So the tail flip, another six seconds, tail flip in response to the flash. Flash, notice that they, they start to wiggle even before the flash is on. They remember that, see? The flash. So the end of the stimulus, a conditioning stimulus. Now six seconds later, huh? You flat, you flip. Another six seconds. So in the absence of conditioning, the 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 fish actually remember the six second interval and then flip again. So there's a reason for this memory, their, for their escape behavior. Uh, it might be useful in their natural environment. So finally, uh, this is, a, this is a, the post-conditioning uh, the tail flips uh, also occur at a conditioning stimulus. Depending on the conditioning stimulus, they, f they flip at right time. And the tail flips are correlated, uh, has a high correlation with the calcium signals recorded in the tectum. Now, now this doesn't suggest, like, um, doesn't uh, proof that the calcium signal or the spiking is responsible for the tail flip, but there's a tight correlation. Uh, this is the first stage where the where the sensory information is processed. There's a memory there in the tectum that are correlated with their behavior response. So the, it's likely they are related. Now this correlation can be shown here that the the for those calcium events there's a high during the conditioning, during the uh, conditioning stimulation, there's a high correlation between uh, the tail flip with calcium event and uh, calcium event with tail flip also have a high, high, uh, high, correlated, high correlation. And this correlation persisted for 30 seconds. The first 30 seconds, you still have a high correlation between the calcium events and the tail flips. And the amplitude of calcium event uh, is actually uh, uh, with the tail, for those uh, uh, with tail flip, the calcium events higher, significantly higher than those calcium events, correlated calcium events with no tail flip. So all this shows the correlation of the activity in the tectum and the uh, behavior of the, of the system. So now, how, how is the uh, spike time independent plasticity involved here? Now, the, the memory appeared to only last for 20 seconds, a very short term. We have not yet pushed that time by using, uh, to see whether that time can be pushed for a longer duration by giving different type of protocol. It's possible that this short term memory can be stored, consolidated into more long term memory. And that long term memory, that consolidation may require uh, changes in the synapse. And at this moment, we only know that in this tactile circuits, there are phenomena associated with the memory of time interval of conditioning, rhythmic conditioning stimulus. Whether the synaptic uh, plasticity is directly involved in coding this uh, information and in consolidating the memory, uh, we are uh, not clear at this moment. But that's for the future work. So to summarize this part, I have shown two examples again. One in the uh, uh, very simple culture model system showing that LTP and LTD, spike time independent plasticity, can be uh, used to store information of the time interval up to 200 milliseconds. Right? So this is a very simple system. Uh, that, uh, the, the feasibility of using the timing of delay so-called delay line mechanism, so that these, the interval information is stored in a spatially distributed manner in different synapses in the polysynaptic network. In the second example, I show in the zebrafish tectum that there's an ensemble of cells whose spiking activity can be entrained by rhythmic sensory stimulus. And that entrainment can last for a while after the sensory stimulus for a short term, for uh, uh, tens of seconds. And the interesting thing is that that entrainment of interval 
the interval timing there is on the order of seconds, pretty long, right? The zebrafish can remember six seconds pretty precisely in this particular case. And, and the rhythmic uh, information, that timing, how was that second information stored and coded by the network of cells is really a, remain a mysterious question to uh, address uh, in coming years. So I'll stop here. And thank you for your attention. And I want to give credit to people who have contributed to the last three parts of my talk, the experimental part, that including all the people uh, that used to be uh, in my laboratory, uh, colleagues in my laboratory at UCSD in Berkeley and Shanghai. And most of them have left and, and find a position elsewhere. And uh, two students in Shanghai is still working in the lab on the uh, primary visual cortex sequ sequence learning. And I have uh, depend on this work with collaboration with colleagues, uh, Yang Dan, and early work on uh, Xenopus uh, tadpoles with Kristen Holt and uh, Bill Harris, and more recent zebrafish work with uh, uh, Herrick Bayer. Thank you. <laughs>